First of all, those of you who don't know who I am, Willie Rebel, uh, Professor in Biochemistry, and I'll MC the uh, proceedings uh, this evening. Uh, and my first uh, piece of business is to call on Professor Patrick Fitzpatrick, Head of the College of Science, Engineering and Food Science, uh, that college and the Elementary Pharmabiotic Centre uh, organised this Science for All competition each year. So, um, that is the head of the College of SEPS, and I have to speak to you now. Hi, it's Willie. Willie's very uh, um, um, self deprecating um, when he says that the Science and Elementary Pharmabiotic Centre, that this would not happen without Willie um, um, putting in such a huge amount of work. The organisation. So, anyway, um, members of the judging panel, you're very welcome. Uh, Larry, Henry, Mary Sullivan, Julie. Huh? Oh, Donovan. Oh, Donovan. I almost said O'Neill, sorry. Julie O'Donovan. Um, that's the first mistake I made tonight. <laughs> uh, you're very welcome, anyway. It is the eighth uh, uh, annual uh, Science for All event. So, in Ireland, there's quite uh, an array of different vehicles for the communication of science and engineering. Um, for example, the Discover Science and Engineering Programme, organised under the auspices of Corpus, um, the ET Young Scientists and Technology Exhibition, a competition and exhibition. Um, this year we're hosting, Dublin's hosting the European City of Science Festival. And there are a huge number of outreach programmes provided by all universities and the colleges. And here in Cork, um, we would say the, the outreach activity in science and engineering by the college sets. And uh, through our newly um, built Eureka Centre, which uh, Noah Brett is coordinating, Noah's the, in there in the audience. And uh, the Tyndall Institute, the Biosciences Institute, the Environmental Research Institute, and the Elementary Pharmabiotic Centre, and all of these are, uh, all have a sort of dedication to bringing science out into the general public. Um, and a lot of what we do is targeted at young students, um, perhaps at school going age, and a lot of it is, you know, targeted at the, at the, uh, in certain areas in the, in the secondary level, but also in the primary level. And the APC puts a specific effort into the primary science area. So it's targeted a lot at, at school students. But um, uh, there's a, there's, and, and there's, a, there's a compelling need for, for communication and science, um, particularly as the, the, we try to move the, the Irish economy into a more um, technology-based. Uh, uh, range of, of uh, disciplines, range of, um, uh, of um, activities, and there's a real need to produce graduates um, to fill the technology um, uh, sector in, in, in the job market. And if we don't do that, we we, we really won't um, do what we need to do. But science communication is more than just um, providing the jobs and, and, and producing scientists and, and, and sort of making people interested in science so that they go into science. It's, it's a lot to do with communication, and it's a whole range of different people who actually communicate on science. Um, people, you know, sociologists and philosophers are very interested in communication on science. Journalists, of course, like Niall, uh, who's one of our judges tonight. Um, curators of museums talk about science. Meteorologists talk about science. And they all speak to the adult audience. And so there's a question, um, you know, why, why, what, what do they, why do they do this? And it's, it's, more, it's more apparent than ever that every aspect of our lives is, has in science embedded in it. And it's really important that even if we don't recognize that immediately, um, for example, when you come to the, um, the challenges of the 21st century, the sorts of challenges that we have to solve in, in environment, in sustainable energy, in, in controlling disease, and providing food for 9 billion people by 2050, these are scientific problems. And go hand in hand also with all of the, the legal and the, um, you know, the, the uh, governance type of issues and the human rights or, uh, issues that, that go along with them, in, in particularly in the developing world. And but we realize that science and engineering, science and the applied science, which is the engineering, is essentially, it's essential to society, it's essential to the movement of, the, of, of humanity. And we also, we need political leaders, we need public policy leaders to debate in science, and we need them, we need the general public to be sufficiently um, literate in science so that they can appreciate the importance of science, but not only that, but that they can appreciate some of the arguments and the fundamental facts and the issues. And our policymakers have to be capable 
or they must be informed, and they have to be able to communicate with their constituents uh, with a relatively um, informed, from a relatively informed perspective on scientific issues. And it, it's, it's, so I, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm a scientist myself, but I don't think policy making and science should be left to scientists. We need the philosophers, and we need the educators, we need the, uh, the social scientists, and we need the public policy makers to understand what we do, and then to communicate those, those issues well, so that they we have an informed and, and scientifically, technologically aware um, voter, voting population. So science communication is really vital, it's really important, and that's one of the reasons that we're here today. But I would add one other word to the, uh, to the mix, and that would be dialogue, because science communication it, it has to enter, the science communicators have to enter into a dialogue with their listeners. It can't be just the case that, uh, um, you know, they, they need to be asked questions and they need to be able to answer the questions. And it can't be just that, you know, um, somebody says, well, I don't understand that argument. And the answer cannot be just, well, you don't need to understand it because we're scientists and we understand it. The answer should be, well, if you don't understand it, let me explain it. And that's again why we're here tonight. And I'd say, um, the, the contestants, who I should add, um, Bruno is from Portugal, Nazmul is from Bangladesh, and it's from Poland, Fiona is from the Republic of Cork, I think, and Christine from that other republic down the road, Kerry. So five nationalities in the, in the, in the competition tonight. Um, and these, these uh, the con con contestants will actually probably kill me for saying this, but um, this, tonight's event is not just about them, it's about you, the audience, as well. And it's, about, it's, it's as much about you as it is about them, in a sense, because you are part of the dialogue. They are saying something to you, and you have to enter into, back into the dialogue. And you can play your part in that dialogue by asking them questions and getting involved in the question and answer sessions after the, after the talks. Um, that will make science communication, the communication part of it, real. You know, you can be nice with questions as well, so not too difficult. Anyway. Once again, you're very welcome here to UCC, and I hope you enjoy the evening. We'll start then, I'll just tell you the way the, uh, the evening will, will work. Um, as Pat said, uh, communication is very important uh, in science and in every other area, but science now, science-based technology runs the economy. So science has, communication science has become critically important uh, compared to past times. And, uh, in acknowledgement and recognition of that, uh, we we run this competition every year. It's been running for eight years, and um, we provide some training for the students in how to uh, communicate to the general public. Uh, and uh, then we run heats uh, to pick uh, five or six finalists. And tonight we have the uh, this year's finalists. Uh, in past years, although not last year. Um, there used to be an All-Ireland version of this also, called um, Science Speak. Uh, whoever thought up that title needed to, <laughs> to get a little bit of training in how to communicate because it sounds awful to me, Science Speak, but that's what it was called, and it's not that important what it was called. But it was the All-Ireland version, and each of the winners from the universities and, um, yeah, it was only the universities, I think, took part, uh, would go to the RDS and there would be an All Ireland final, and um, Pat Kenny used to chair it. Uh, and it fell foul of the cutbacks, even though it would cost very little to run this. But we were, hoping, we were hoping to resurrect it this year, but please God, it will uh, run next year. And we were doing very well in that. Um, we won it twice and were second several times. So um, uh, UCC was doing very well. One of our past winners is on the panel of judges tonight, uh, Julia O'Donovan, who won the Science Speak in 2009. Um, so uh, the uh, Science for All uh, event is open to um, postgraduate students in the College of SET and um, beyond. Uh, senior PhD students who have accumulated some results uh, and the idea is they present the results of their research uh, in a 10 minute talk uh, in a manner that's um, understandable by a general audience. It's, uh, I hope, uh, good fun to take part in the competition. It doesn't take up that much time. 
They already have their results, or they should have at this stage, a lot of them. And um, it's, uh, as I say, an enjoyable um, exercise. Um, our panel, we have a panel of judges, um, and our panel is seated in the front row here. Uh, the chair of the panel is um, Anne-Marie O'Sullivan, uh, who is the executive director of a large communications uh, agency called H&A Marketing and Public Relations. Uh, so that's Anne-Marie, and she's chairing. And the, the other judges are Trevor Holmes, um, who's the Vice President for External Affairs here in UCC. Um, communications is very important. We now have a Vice President for Communications. Um, uh, Niall Murray, who is the Education uh, Correspondent with the Irish Examiner. Um, Julie O'Donovan, whom I mentioned already. Julie um, has a PhD in Maths. Uh, she works uh, in the CIT and also has uh, an institute of mathematics um, in, uh, in, in Cork, um, which is involved in education, uh, of, uh, education in mathematics at third level. Um, and uh, yeah, these are our, our four judges, and we thank them for doing that. Um, as Pat said, the five finalists reflect the international um, dimension of the university. Um, when I was a student at UCD, uh, we did have some foreign students, of course, um, non-Irish students, but um, they were relatively few and far between, but that day has, uh, has uh, changed. It's different, and uh, uh, Pat already alluded to that um, uh, in the lineup we have here tonight. Um, so, uh, each will present for 10 minutes. Um, it would be as well if you didn't move too far from the lectern when you're um, giving your presentation, um, because uh, we're filming the event, and um, so that the camera doesn't have to follow you all over the, the stage. After your 10 minute presentation, there will be five minutes for questions, mainly from the judges, but it, it might be possible for a member of the audience to ask a question also. And we have roving microphones to facilitate that. Uh, at uh, 8.50, one run before 8.50. Um, anyway, when the, ten, when the presentations are <coughs> finished, we'll have a break. And we have uh, tea and coffee and soft drinks uh, outside in the lobby uh, for the audience. Uh, the ju for all judges will stay here and um, try and pick a winner. Then at 8.50 we'll have presentation of awards and prizes and then we'll close at 9. Uh, there are feedback forms uh, distributed around there. We'd be obliged if you'd fill them out and uh, we'll, will they leave them on the benches, Catherine? Yeah, or? Okay. Leave them on the benches, we collect them. Um, Catherine Buckley in the front here has a timer and will time your 10 minute talk. So she will give you a signal when there's one minute uh, left and uh, another signal when your time is up. But I'm sure you're all at this stage able to stay within the time. Um, so that's about it. I'm delighted to see a good uh, turnout for, for this evening and to see the good few faces from the public lecture series because we were uh, announcing it, um, this event at that, and uh, to see some very uh, some representatives here of very young people as well, as um, students, third level students and older people. So without further ado then we'll go on to the talks. First talk is Bruno Godino from Portugal and from the Department of Anatomy and Neuroscience here in uh, UCC. And his talk is entitled Hunting Disease Messages in the Brain. So good evening everyone, my name is Bruno. Uh, I'm a PhD student in the School of Pharmacy and in the Department of Anatomy and Neuroscience. And I'll be talking today about hunting disease matches in the brain and how this can be used to treat disorders of the nervous system. I'll start by giving a small introduction about Huntington's disease. Huntington's disease is, causes cell death in specific structures in the brain. And the fact that cells die, patients show different uh, symptoms as this rapid involuntary rapid movements that
uh, this lady is having and is not unable, unable to control. So basically, uh, patients bend forward and backwards and they're not able to control any of these movements. It is important to say as well that Huntington's disease um, is not only about motor deficits, there are also neuropsychiatric manifestations as depression and as anxiety. Patients do also complain that they constantly forget things and that all these symptoms bring, bring their quality of life down. An affected parent has 50% chance of getting an affected child, and the disease affects men and women equally. There's no cure or preventive treatment for Huntington's disease, and the current therapies are only able to control some of the symptoms for a certain period of time. Research nowadays is, is focusing on targeting the cause of Huntington's disease. And to bring it to some understanding, I want you to think of cells as small factories. So in factories, we have an administration, which we'll be calling nucleus here. And in this administration, we have different genes or executives. These executives, they generate messages that they send to different workstations within the cell that will produce the different tools that the cell needs. We'll call these tools proteins. So proteins can be regulatory, they can be structural, they can be for transport. What happens in Huntington's disease is that we have a crazy uh, executive and he generates bad messages. When these bad messages reach the workstations, instead of a good protein, we have a bad protein, an abnormal protein. And this will be fine if the cell could get rid of it, but when, as it's not able to get rid of it, it accumulates and this protein starts to interact with other proteins and then disrupt cellular function, and this causes cellular death. So in Huntington's disease, we have a defect within the Huntington gene, which causes an erroneous message to be generated, and then an abnormal protein. Luckily, our cells have a mechanism based in silencing molecules, and this, we can use these silencing molecules to regulate this message. So if we could use this system to block the bad message, we will be able to stop the formation of this bad protein and still have our good protein. Now, the main issue with these molecules is they are too big and they're not able to get across the cellular membrane. Also, these this silencing molecules are easily recognized by the immune system. They're captured and destroyed. So it's, it's, it's in this getting these molecules across the cellular membrane that the pharmacodelivery group in the School of Pharmacy and the one that I work for come in. Basically, we're we developed these sugar-based carriers called psychodextrins, and they are, look like this inverted uh, bottomless glass, let's say. And we modified that with lipid chains on top and some positive groups on the bottom so that we could have them interacting with our silencing molecules and forming small particles. So our first experiment was basically to determine the size of these particles to see if they were small enough to get across the membrane. So we mix our, our, our carriers with the silencing molecules and we discovered that we were able to, to form particles 350 times smaller than the diameter of one hair. We also realized, excuse me, we also realized that as we increase the amount of carrier, the particle size would diminish. So the key aspects of our carriers out there, they're non-toxic, they're able to bind the silencing molecules and they protect them from degradation. So we were happy with the properties of the, of, the, of the particles. So we needed to figure out if they were able to do what we want them to do, which is carry the particles inside the cell. So we started by tagging a fluorescent tag onto a silencing molecule, complexing that with our carrier and taking that across the cellular membrane and looking under the microscope. So we did that with two, two laboratory cell-based models. One is a, is a rat brain cell. The other one is a human skin cell that was collected from a human patient that was affected with Huntington's disease. As you can see from the images there, you can see that our carriers were able to um, transport the silencing molecules onto the cells and, the, and they're mainly localized around the nucleus where all the messages are generated from. So we're very happy about these results and we needed to figure out if they were doing what they're meant to do, so silence the bad messages. So basically, when an sRNA gets into a cell, different proteins bind to it and select one of the strands, the one that have the right code to silence the message. So when this happens, the, the silencing complex will bind to a certain message and will break it, and then this will be targeted for degradation of, by other proteins, all right? 
So for our next experiment, what we did was basically use specific silencing molecules targeted to the Huntington message and non-specific ones. And we mixed them both with our carriers, delivered them onto our uh, cell-based models, and then we assessed how many messages were left in the end. So, and these are the results. Basically, untreated cells, we set the expression of this message as 100% for the untreated cells. The, the cells that were treated only with the silencing molecules with no carrier had no reduction in the number of messages. And this is, wasn't surprising because they're not able to get into the cells. Now, when we use our, our vectors to transport these silencing molecules into the cells, we saw a reduction of 50% in the rat brain cells and in, of 65% in the human skin cells. When you use non-specific silencing molecules, we figure out that there was no reduction in the, in the number of messages, which means that this is a specific um, action. Now, we were very happy about this. This is very important to show. So we needed to figure out if we were able to uh, improve the symptoms in a mouse model. So we got this mouse model, these mice, they have Huntington's disease, basically, and we did brain surgery in these animals, and we injected them seven times over a period of five weeks. Basically, and then we use, and, th and then we assess their behavior, we assess their behavior in a rotor task. Basically, the rotor task consists in placing the animal on top of a rod. The rod will rotate, and the animal, when it's not able to stand anymore on the rod, will fall, and we'll record that time. So, as you see from the video there, the animals that were untreated, were treated with only vehicle, or were treated with the silencing molecules with no carrier, they fall first than the animals that were treated with our nanoparticles or the animals treated with, or the animals that were just normal mice. So this is the same that you can see there in this graph here. So basically, the, the, a normal mouse will, have, will hold very well to the rod. The, an animal that has Huntington's disease will fall from the rod quicker, okay? The animals that were treated with our um, delivery system, with our nanoparticles, hold much better to the rod. When we stop injecting, they degenerate and they meet up the, the ones that weren't treated. So in the end, our sugar-based carriers are able, to, are able to transport these silencing molecules into nerve cells, and blocking these messages in the mouse brain ameliorates some of the symptoms. But we weren't able to improve survival in these animals. So further modifications are now being introduced in the carriers, and we, we are willing to administer this instead of by brain injections through intravenously. So I want to acknowledge the funding from the Irish Drug Delivery Network, the SFI. I want to um, acknowledge my supervisors uh, for all the support and encouragement and the students and staff from the biopharmaceutics, pharmacology, and anatomy and neuroscience labs. I also want to acknowledge Science for All for giving me this opportunity to showcase my research and all of you for your time and attention. Hello, everybody. My name is Mohammed Najmul Hussain. I'm continuing my PhD in the Photonics Center of Tindal National Institute. I am doing research in a European Union project. The aim of that project is to develop an optical biosensor that will be able to diagnose cancer biomarker, but not limited to that. It will also be able to detect different type of virus, bacteria, but the interesting thing is that the design mechanism of the sensor has been inspired by some natural architecture, like the butterfly wing or the natural opal architecture. We, a group of researchers in the Tyndall National Institute, have been trying to imitate that natural perfection and supremacy for our sensing purpose. Here, the spectacular rainforest butterfly. The light blue color of the butterfly wing is not due to the dye or pigment there. Rather, the reason is down to the microarchitecture. And this has suddenly been noticed by the researchers. They have been examining the morphous architecture down to the finest detail. Each and every wing scale of the butterfly wing is composed of ridges. And these ridges are separated 
such a distance that is same as the wavelength of blue light. So when the sunlight bounces off these periodic structures, the blue light reflects. So the light blue color of the butterfly wing is not due to any pigment or dye there, rather it is due to the microarchitecture. And this type of microarchitecture is technically known as photonic crystal. So any repeated structures that is separated at a fixed distance is photonic crystal. So here there are nine rectangles, each are same and separated at a fixed distance. As it is repeated in the one direction, it is known as one dimensional photonic crystals. The repetition can be of rectangles, circles or whatever the unit cell is. We can also make a repetition in two direction that will be known as two dimensional photonic crystals. And obviously you can also get three dimensional photonic crystal by repeating in three direction. So the aim of my project is to study the performance of that photonic crystals for sensing purpose. But primarily, we are focusing on the one dimensional photonic crystal for our sensor. However, the cancer diagnosis is an important issue due to its widespread occurrence. According to the National Cancer Registry of Ireland, around 30,000 new cases of cancers are diagnosed in each year in Ireland. And the number is expected to increase to 40,000 by 2020. Lung cancer, breast cancer, and prostate cancer are the three leading causes of death in the United States. The survival of a cancer patient heavily depends on early detection. But the conventional diagnosis methods, some of them are based on labeling, and some of them based on imaging, they are not capable enough to detect the cancer early stage. The labeling-based technique is tedious, making real-time monitoring impossible, and sometimes it may alter the biochemical properties of the analytes. There are other diagnosis methods that are based on imaging, like magnetic resonance imaging, computer tomography, or ultrasound imaging. But the main problem, they are not able to detect the cancer at early stage. Though costly and invasive, they are not selective enough. So we are going to use the cancer biomarker for our early stage detection. So at first, what is biomarker? You know that the diabetic patients measure their blood sugar to know, the, to know their disease state. So blood sugar is the biomarker or bioindicator for the diabetic disease. Similarly, we are going to discover and detect the cancer biomarker, especially the pancreatic cancer biomarker. So one of our uh, uh, partner institutions is focusing on that. I will mention it later. So four individual pancre pancreatic cancer biomarker will be used for detecting the disease state. Here I'm going to show in a simplistic manner that how the natural supremacy of design architecture can be used for sensing purpose. Here you can see a rectangular photonic crystals, same as the butterfly wing, I am going to inject light of three different color. The blue light can easily pass through the photonic crystals, but the green light is trapped at the photonic crystal region. It is the property of the photonic crystal. It can block light of a specific color. The red can also pass through. So if you put a detector at the received end and start measuring the received light, you will be able to see the blue and red light, but not green. It will drop the intensity of your received light at the color of green. If I put some uh, cancer biomarker into the photonic crystal region, it will change the refractive index, that is another technical term, of the photonic crystal region, and now the photonic crystal will block light of another color. So that incident will tell us the presence of cancer biomarker in the photonic crystal region. Tyndall National Institute is one of Europe's leading Research Institute in Photonics. The central fabrication facility of our institute has the capability in the areas of silicon, compound semiconductor, and polymers. So at first, I have designed the photonic crystals for sensing purpose by using the computation facility of our institute and have started fabricating or building those photonic crystals. Here you can see the cross-sectional view of the photonic crystals 
and how the biomolecules are attached at the sensing region, at the top picture. The bottom left picture shows one of our built one-dimensional photonic crystal, same as the butterfly wing, and the right picture shows how the reflected light is shifting due to the presence of cancer biomolecules in the photonic crystal sensing region. So several institutions are also in part of our project. Tyndall National Institute is the coordinator of that project. And as a PhD student, I have been assigned to design the photonic crystal for our sensing purpose and to maximize its sensitivity. So designing of the photonic crystal is my whole purpose here in this project. Another university, University of Manchester from United Kingdom, they will do the surface chemistry, how the biomolecules will be attached in a very small photonic crystal region. And there are some other institutions like Sierra Sensors from Germany. They will do the microfluidic pairs, how the blood drop will be put into the sensing region selectively. And the Lund University from Sweden, they, are dis they have already discovered the cancer biomarker signature for the early stage detection of the pancreatic cancer. So we are going to use those biomarkers. And they have already secured the intellectual property right on those biomarkers. So there are some extraordinary features of our proposed biosensors. At first, it is label-free and invasive, non-invasive. And the sensing region is very small. If I compare the photonic crystal sensing region with a human hair, it is smaller than that. That means that for only a one drop of blood, we will be able to do diagnosis of several times. And the sensor obviously will be in low cost and there wouldn't be any compromise in the sensitivity compared to the laboratory-based test. But the main important thing that it will help us to detect the cancer in the early stages. The se this type of sensing mechanism is not limited to only cancers. We can also tailor the design for uh, some uh, clinical diagnostic, diagnostic or drug discovery or some natural disease diagnosis. It may also be tailored for environmental monitoring system. So now I am going to sum up my uh, presentations. At first, we have discovered the reason behind the spectacular light blue color of the morpho butterfly wing. And then we have uh, pointed out the severity of cancers, especially the pancreatic cancers, and what are the main reasons behind it, behind those, and what are the shortcomings uh, 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 to diagnose the cancers in early stages and how to overcome, we are going to overcome it. Then I have uh, described very briefly the underlying principle of these photonic crystal-based sensors and some future aspects of our sensing mechanism to other sectors as well. Actually, the, uh, the project has several pairs, and it, is, it was very difficult for me to, uh, uh, to uh, assemble all the projects in, in a 10 minutes presentations. So I will be very glad to answer any questions from uh, any pairs of my presentation. Good evening. My name is Anna Iwaszuk, and I would like to talk about the hydrogen as a new energy source. And I would like to uh, explain how we design a catalyst to produce uh, hydrogen. First of all, I would like to ask you uh, about your daily life. We, we, we get up, we, we switch on our uh, kettles, we make tea, we, we take our cars, we take buses, we go to work, we switch on the computers. All these activities are connected with the energy. And what are the sources of energy? At the moment, we, we, most of our energy is used for, from fossil, fossil fuels. And uh, what are the fossil fuels? Uh, the common fossil fuels are coal, petroleum, and natural gas. And they, they, they were uh, made uh, hundreds of mil million years ago by natural processes. They are, they are non-renewable -re because we use them much quicker than they were made. So what is the world energy consumption at the moment? As we can see, 
three major parts, brown, red, and yellow, are petroleum, coal, and dry natural gas. It means that around 88% of the global energy usage comes from fossil fuels. How Ireland is dependent on fossil fuel fuels? 95% of, of energy in Ireland comes from fossil fuels, and this energy and these fuels are uh, from the countries which actually the resources are diminishing. Current statement that Ireland may be over 2 trillion cubic feet of natural gas show that there is a big opportunity for Ireland to be independent and this natural gas can supply for a number of years, can also create significant number of jobs. But from the other side of this, we have a method and process which, which will, can obtain the, the natural gas. And this is an, uh, a hydraulic fr fracking, which also open hot discussion on the environmental issues. So we need to think about other sources of energy. And, and we need to think about the renewable sources of energy. And these are the sources which we need to take into consideration. This was also emphasized by Department of Energy Com Communication and Natural Resources that we need to become more independent from fossil fuels. So what, what are the best candidates for, for, the, for the fuels in the future? So one of them is uh, hydrogen which is uh, uh, um, really available in water. Uh, we could produce hydrogen from water by splitting the water. There are still some issues with the, with the reaction itself, like a high temperature. So we would like to reduce the temperature of production of the hydrogen. And by that, we could use a catalyst. So catalyst, it's the material which speeds up the reaction, but it's not consumed by the, by the reaction. So when we have two reactants, they meet our catalyst. Catalyst will help to reaction happen. We get the products. The products are released, and we have a, in this cycle, we have catalyst which is ready for the next reaction. So my work, is focused on, devel on development of new catalysts which will be activated by solar energy and will help us to make the reaction of water splitting and our, one of our products will be a hydrogen. What are the material requirements? One of the uh, requirements is that material should be non-toxic should be active on solar, solar light. And why we, we already choose titanium dioxide. It's a, a well-known material and has high application in sport, medicine, food, and uh, cosmetics. Even we use it every day uh, with our tooth, toothpaste. And my material uh, needs to be also a novel structure. So how titanium dioxide works? When we uh, have uh, our titanium dioxide, we, this, the, sun, uh, the, the, the light is ab absorbed by, uh, by, by our titanium dioxide, and titanium is uh, transferring electron to water, and water is, uh, is split, to, and the products are hydrogen and oxygen. So why we want to improve this material? because only 4% of the solar energy can be absorbed at the moment. So our aim is to improve the material to have a better efficiency. So I work with the base material, which is titanium dioxide, and I, and I try to improve mat material by deposition on, on, on different kind of materials, and I check the properties of this material especially uh, 
interface, new interface between material and, uh, and our titanium dioxide. How I use that? How I do that? I use uh, computers to, to design my mater material, so I'm using computer simu simulation tools. I have an access to high performance computers in, uh, in Dublin, and this, uh, this aspect that I work on a computer and also I have an access to uh, super computers makes my work uh, very effective and this has a big impact on time and the cost of the research. Uh, still, um, b because my material is very, s is very small for comparison, a uh, grain of sand is a one milli mi millimeter and my material is one million times smaller. There is still a big challenge to produce this material in the, labor in the laboratory and also the cost is, is huge. So first we would like to simulate the material to find the properties and then build the material which will be uh, a, a promising material. Uh, for the summary, I would like to say that we simulated approximately 150 uh, structures, new structures, and we have uh, a very promising results. Some of these structures uh, were, already, were, already, uh, were already tested in, uh, in the experiment, so they were already mm -hmm. built in Japan and also the, uh, the, the predicted properties were confirmed by the experimentalist. So in the further, stu further study, uh, we would like to um, study m more the properties to be able uh, to optimize material composition and then uh, to pass it to industry apl application. So our future uh, would, would like uh, a bit different than now. If, if, we can, if we are able to, to have this catalyst work, then uh, instead of going uh, to the station to fuel our cars with the gasoline, we, we have hydrogen, and then um, we, we use the cars which will be powered by, by hydrogen. This has also a, a positive impact on the environment because uh, uh, f uh, hydrogen as a fuel is a potential, uh, is a pot potentially uh, have no impact on the environment. Uh, uh, I would like to thank to my supervisor, Dr. Michael Nolan, Chemistry Department, Science Foundation of Ireland, and Irish Center of High End Computing. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, good evening everyone. Uh, my name is Fiona O'Brien. I'm a PhD student here in UCC in uh, the School of Pharmacy, the Department of Anatomy and Neuroscience and the Elementary Pharmabiotic Centre. Uh, this evening I'm going to talk to you about uh, the research I do here in UCC, which may lead to a new approach to overcome the barrier to successful treatment of depression. So first of all, depression. It's a devastating mental disorder which is characterized by feelings of low mood and um, excessive feelings of guilt, lack of self-worth. It can impair a person's ability to concentrate, to sleep properly, um, and can even lead to suicide in its, in its worst form. So this has a, obviously has a, a very uh, debilitating effect on the individual and on society as a whole. Furthermore, depression is really common. I would say that everyone in this room knows somebody who has suffered from depression at some stage in their life. And the World Health Organization estimates that around 121 million people suffer from depression worldwide at any given time. So the, the, the crippling nature of the symptoms and the high prevalence mean that depression is among the most debilitating uh, disabilities uh, in the world. Furthermore, currently available treatments are inadequate with uh, approximately one third of depressed patients don't respond uh, to, to currently available treatments. So there's a major uh, impetus and a huge un unmet demand for more effective treatments. In order to develop these uh, more effective treatments, we firstly need to understand why some patients don't respond to depression. And emerging research indicates that the blood-brain barrier may be involved in this. So the blood-brain barrier was first observed by a, a, a renowned German scientist named Paul Ehrlich over 100 years ago 
when he noticed that after injecting a dye intravenously into a rat, that this dye spread to all the organs in the body, apart from the brain and the spinal cord. As you can see here um, in this diagram, while the brain and the spinal cord remain white, the rest of the body is stained black. So this highlighted that there, there was some, some way that the brain was protected and kept separate from, from the bloodstream and from the, the rest of the body. We now know that the bloodstream is made up of the, the vessel walls of the blood vessels in the brain, as is illustrated in this video. Uh, the blood-brain barrier serves really important functions, so it helps to protect the brain from harmful substances which may be present in the blood, and it also helps to maintain a constant supply of vital nutrients, um, of vital nutrients the brain needs to carry out its important functions. However, it's also a major obstacle to the treatment of brain diseases as most drugs are unable to cross the blood-brain barrier, as you can see with these green molecules here, whereas other drugs are able to cross the blood-brain barrier and these can be effective in the treatment of brain diseases. So as I said, it's a major ob the blood-brain barrier is a major obstacle in the treatment of brain disorders as if you, if you think about it, if you take a tablet to treat a brain disorder, this tablet gets absorbed into your bloodstream through the gut and the bloodstream distributes it throughout the body and it needs to be able to transfer from the blood into the brain to treat the brain disorder. However, if the, if the drug can't cross the, the blood-brain barrier, it won't be effective. The blood-brain barrier doesn't consist of just the, the physical walls of the blood vessels. There are also various processes at play which help to regulate the blood-brain barrier, and drug transporters are one of these uh, processes, and they play an important role at the blood-brain barrier. So here you can see a drug transporter, this purple uh, shape here, which is expressed at the interior uh, side of the wall of the blood vessel in the brain. Uh, these are said to act as gatekeepers to the brain, and they've been likened to, to bouncers. And uh, P glycoprotein is the most important of these transporters, or the head bouncer. So what these drug transporters can do is they can allow certain molecules to pass through the blood-brain barrier and enter the brain while uh, preventing others, much like a, a bouncer. So uh, P glycoprotein, or PGP, it limits the ability of transported drugs to reach the brain. So this is illustrated in this diagram here, where you have a cross-section of a blood vessel in the brain and two molecules the green molecule and the blue molecule, or the green and the blue drug. So these drugs are very similar. The one discriminating factor between them is that the green molecule is transported by PGP, while the blue molecule isn't, or the blue drug. So the blue drug can freely pass between the blood and the brain, whereas the green molecule, as it tries to pass into the brain, is pumped back out or bounced out by PGP. And PGP transport is linked to treatment failure in many diseases, including brain cancer and epilepsy. And it's also been shown to restrict brain concentrations of several antidepressants from numerous different classes, including the antidepressant imipramine, which is the one that we look at in our studies. And it has been suggested that drug uh, transport or drug efflux by P-glycoprotein could be linked to treatment-resistant depression or could contribute to treatment-resistant depression. So our research hypothesis <coughs> is that if we block PGP, we should be able to enhance the transport of the antidepressant imipramine across the blood-brain barrier, thereby leading to higher brain concentrations uh, without affecting levels of the drug in the blood. So if you look at the, the, the schematic on the right-hand side again, you'll see that um, under normal circumstances, PGP allows a certain proportion of the, the imipramine in green to reach the brain while uh, pumping some of it back, whereas we think if we, if we block PGP, we should be able to achieve uh, a greater proportion of imipramine in the bloodstream will reach the brain. The question is, how can we test this hypothesis? The blood-brain barrier, as I mentioned, is, it's a very complex um, barrier with various processes, both physical and pumps and metabolic going on. So in order to test it, we need to test it in an intact organism, and we use laboratory rats. And we measured blood and brain levels of the drug imipramine with and without pretreatment of a PGP blocker in these rats over time. And we were able to measure the brain levels using a cutting edge technique known as intracerebral microdialysis, which allowed us to monitor uh, imipramine levels in the brain over time after administering the drug. And we used two different PGP blockers. We used verapamil and cyclosporin A. These drugs also have other uses, but they, they both inhibit uh, P glycoprotein. So we ended up with three three groups in our design. We had the imipramine-only group, which only received imipramine, and with the IMI plus RAP and IMI plus CSA, plus CSA groups, which were P-treated with a PGP blocker. 
So first off, we looked at imipramine levels in the blood so that we could see if, our P if blocking PGP altered imipramine levels in the blood somehow, which might explain any variation we saw in the brain rather than uh, enhanced transport across the blood-brain barrier itself. So first off, we saw that we were able to measure um, imipramine levels in the blood after one administration, and we saw that blocking PGP didn't lead to any significant changes in imipramine levels in the blood. So any changes that we were to see in the brain would be due to enhanced transport across the blood-brain barrier. In the brain, we were able to measure um, imipramine levels in the brain in animals that were just treated with imipramine. And we saw that pre-treating these animals with PGP blockers led to significant increases in the uh, imipramine concentrations in the brain, both in the verapamil pre-treated pre animals in green and the cyclosporin A pre-treated animals in blue. So this suggests that inhibiting PGP or blocking PGP does lead to higher levels of this antidepressant in the brain. So in summary, we saw that pre-treatment with the PGP blocker increases the transport of the antidepressant imipramine across the blood-brain barrier. Uh, as you can see in this graph, uh, the blood-brain barrier transport is increased in both the verapamil and cyclosporin A pre-treated group, and even more so in the cyclosporin A group. And that's not unexpected as cyclosporin A is a more potent or stronger blocker of PGP than verapamil. And this might mean that blocking PGP to augment antidepressant treatment could represent a novel approach to overcome depression. This could manifest itself in improved patient response in patients uh, who get a greater uh, therapeutic concentration of antidepressants in their brains or through reduced off-target side effects. So one major problem with some antidepressants is that in addition to the, the effects they have in the brain where they help to treat the depression itself, they can lead to unwanted side effects in other organs of the body. So if you can give a lower dose and still achieve a, a, a therapeutic concentration in the brain, you might be able to reduce these side effects and have the same or better um, therapeutic response. There's one caveat, which is that further studies are needed to determine if this approach uh, will prove to be beneficial and safe in patients. So I would like to acknowledge, uh, first off, the organizers of Science for All, um, Catherine, Jill, and, and Willie in particular. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge my PhD supervisors, Professor Krein and Dr. Griffin, and everybody in, in my lab and all the other labs who've helped me with my work. And finally, thank you all for your attention, and I'd like to in invite any questions you might have. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My title is Macrophages, which are probably the most interesting innate immune cells in our body. So hopefully by the end of my talk, you'll find them as interesting as I do. So I'm a PhD student in the Department of Biochemistry, as well as the Elementary Pharmabiotics Centre. So first of all, what are macrophages? They are key players in our innate immune system, and they protect us against bacterial and pathogenic infections. Macrophages are found at all sites in our bodies, and depending on the different environmental stimuli that they encounter in these environments, they have a range of different activation states. They are found in our livers, our spleens, our lungs, to our guts. And the three main activation states are your classically activated M1 macrophage that is very, very potent in killing bacteria by phagocytosis, where bacteria are engulfed by the macrophage and they are killed. And also, these cells interact with, with other cells of our immune system, leading to massive inflammation and clearing of infection. Then we have another class of macrophages, which are more anti-inflammatory in nature. And these are really important in clearing parasitic infections. And then lastly, you have the regulatory macrophages, which are, have an overlapping phenotype between the two. So lipopolysaccharide, this is a really, really dangerous molecule and it's found on the outer surface of gram-negative bacteria such as E. coli and salmonella. And it is this molecule that is actually recognized by macrophages and it converts a relatively silent macrophage into a very potent killing macrophage. And essentially it engulfs then bacteria and clears infection and it also leads to activation of our adaptive immune response, our B and our T cells. So after a period of time, you need to prevent overactivation of our immune system. And macrophages have this inbuilt mechanism that controls this and that limits our response to LPS. Essentially, they become unresponsive. So this here highlighting our genes, which are molecular units of heredity encoded by our DNA. It is what makes us have brown eyes or green eyes, curly hair or straight hair. 
In terms of a macrophage, genes are that are turned on or turned off are absolutely essential for their function in terms of phagocytosis, eating up the bacteria and removing them, and produ production of pro-inflammatory cytokines and clearance of infection. So what you get is this switching on in red of genes that are completely turned on, and then during LPS tolerance, where you become unresponsive to repeated challenges with LPS, you get a switching off of genes that are very, very important to be turned off because if you had them constantly turned on, you could lead to massive tissue damage and subsequently chronic inflammation. So, so far I've shown that macrophages are very, very immune protective in our body, but what happens when they are associated with any dysregulation? And this has often have been associated with cancer, arteriosclerosis and heart disease, obesity and insulin resistance, as well as chronic inflammatory conditions such as multiple sclerosis, inflammatory bowel disease, as well as fibrosis of the liver and the lung. And in all of these disease states, macrophages play a really key role. And what actually happens is you are getting a switch from one macrophage state to another state which is not the norm in that particular environment. So my focus of my research is on LPS tolerance and more specifically the breakdown of tolerance. Now, a certain level of tolerance needs to be maintained in our bodies in particular environments because any overactivation or breakdown of tolerance could be quite detrimental. You do not want lots of production of pro-inflammatory cytokines that could damage our tissues. So maintenance of tolerance in particular environments such as our gut is very, very important to prevent overactivation. However, a certain level of breakdown is also required because if you had cells in our body in a particular environment that are locked in a tolerant state, they are completely unresponsive to repeated challenges to new bacteria. So trying to find this balance where the fine line of understanding the mechanism in the breakdown of tolerance is absolutely essential in understanding any dysregulation of this balance that could lead to either chronic inflammation or sepsis, which would be due to us not being able to react to the bacteria. So why study the breakdown of tolerance in macrophages? First of all, we want to understand the mechanism behind this, and most importantly, and I suppose most interesting for me, is trying to find these cells in vivo or in, in our bodies. Are they associated with chronic inf inflammatory conditions such as inflammatory bowel disease? Inflammatory bowel disease is a very, very potent autoimmune or chronic inflammatory condition of the, of the gut. And what happens is you get overactivation of our immune system in our gut, which is a normally tolerant environment. So we are questioning whether macrophages in our gut that live there in a tolerant state are responsible for the development of chronic inflammation. So what we use is we isolate macrophages from mice uh, from their bone marrow, or we use them from their peritoneal or abdominal cavity. And once we isolate these macrophages, we want to ensure that they are absolutely a pure population because isolating any sort of cell from either a human or a mouse, you get a mixed population of cells. So because I'm looking at macrophages, we use an, an immunological tool called flow cytometry. Excuse me. And this measures how pure a population is based on proteins that are expressed on its cell surface. And when you work with macrophages, you should have greater than 98% positive for these two markers, CD11B and F480. So once you have your macrophage population, what we want to do is we want to look at the genes that were specifically turned on or turned off in the breakdown of LPS tolerance. So I mentioned that our genes are molecular units of hereditary encoded by our DNA. And in terms of macrophages, genes that are turned on or off could be important for their metabolism, uh, production of cytokines and chemokines in promoting inflammation as well as pathogen recognition. So what we did is we took macrophages and we converted them into four different states. We had an untreated or naive macrophage, or we created the M1 pro-inflammatory classically activated macrophage. Then we created an M2 macrophage, which is, represents our LPS tolerant macrophage. And then we were also able to induce a breakdown in tolerance in these cells. What we did is we took the RNA from these cells and we put them on this chip called a microarray chip. And this is a really, really great tool, which is something you cannot do in the lab because it's such a large scale experiment. And it allows us to look to, at greater than 55,000 genes that are specifically upregulated or downregulated in each of these cell types. And it gives a readout based on genes turned on here in red or genes turned off in green. 
So the breakdown of LPS tolerance revealed that we were looking at a massive change in the genes that were turned on or off in these cells. Greater than 2,000 genes were specifically turned on or off. And actually what you must note is that there's quite a lot of overlap between all the different states, LPS tolerance and our initial LPS activation which represent our M1 macrophage. And these could be genes that are important for macrophage function that's not necessarily associated with inflammation. So this complex map is what we call a heat map. And it really represents the global gene expression profile of these cells. Essentially, genes that are turned on in red or genes turned off in green. And the take home message here is that if you look at each of the individual columns with representing each of the different states, none of them look the same. This really highlights that macrophages are really, really good at adapting to the different environmental stimuli that they encounter. So, one of the most exciting things for me was that. This profiling study was able to reveal that we were looking at a completely new macrophage population that has not previously been described. With greater than 2,000 genes specifically upregulated or downregulated, that's either been turned off or on in these cells, in the breakdown of tolerance. So, one of the major questions I needed to ask was where in the spectrum of macrophage activation do these cells belong? And in order to do this, we used a tool called flow cytometer to measure. Uh, proteins that were expressed on the cell surface of these cells. And we were able to identify two chemokine receptors, CCR3 and CCR5, that were uniquely expressed in these cells that break down tolerance. And these markers are actually very important in recruiting other innate immune cells and, and uh, members of the adaptive immune response, such as our T and B cells, to sites of inflammation, suggesting that these cells could recruit other cells to uh, environmental uh, states and promoting chronic inflammation. So finally, one of the most interesting things as well for me was that there was quite a difference in the way these cells that break tolerance interact with our T cells, which are members of our adaptive response that are important for clearing and clearing infection. Our classically activated M1 macrophage has very, very high expression of our this marker CD86 and CD80. However, when you break down tolerance, the CD86 levels were still quite high. However, CD80 levels were completely removed, not the same as an M1 macrophage. This really highlighted that, with, that there were defects in their ability to interact with the T cells. So in summary, the breakdown of LPS tolerance promotes this global change in the macrophage gene profile. You get a switching on of certain genes and switching off of other genes. Essentially, you are getting a novel macrophage activation state that expressed a number of key, mem key chemokine receptors that identified them as being unique. So if we can understand the mechanism behind the breakdown of LPS tolerance and what is causing the generation of these new cells, it will give us a better understanding of how these cells are related to chronic inflammation and subsequently lead to the treatment of these diseases in the future. So I'd like to acknowledge first everyone here tonight. So thank you for listening and I'm open to questions. I'd like to thank all the organizers of Science for All, as well as my funding body, SFI. And then I would also like to thank my supervisor, Dr. Rory Camerody, members of the host response group of the Elementary Firm Robotics Center and the Department of Biochemistry. So thank you. The chair of the judging panel to uh, say a few words about the judge's um, reaction to the presentations and to announce the winner. And uh, then uh, Anne-Marie will call the winner up and the others, the other speakers, and uh, Alan Kelly, uh, Dean of Graduate Studies, will present the prizes and um, will then say a few words himself. And uh, I'll finish things off then with a few words and uh, we'll let you uh, go home for the night and um, relax. So Anne-Marie O'Sullivan. Thanks Willie. Um, could I just start by saying um, on behalf of um, the, my fellow judges, um, we were hugely impressed with the standard um, of this evening. I know that sounds like a cliche. 
um, but genuinely um, those concepts are, uh, were all you know, so different, so varied, um, so technical, um, and yet became very accessible um, to us um, as we sat there and we listened. I think there was a fantastic use of visual aids. I think everything from the videos, um, the different graphics, the cartoons, all of that, it just really brought the concepts to life. Um, and that's really what we're about. This needs to feel, science for all means, you know, the concepts need to be accessible for people. And speaking as a completely non-technical or a-technical person, um, I did feel that I could go out from here this evening and certainly bluff my way through a few of the concepts. So well done to the guys for that. Um, I was also hugely impressed, and I think we all were, in terms of the confidence shown by um, the five presenters this, presenters this evening. Um, it's a very different discipline to have to stand up in front of a group of people that don't share the same level of, of expertise in your own chosen field, um, and to be able to um, highlight your own research and get that point across to people um, is not um, an easy ask. So well done um, to all the presenters this evening for doing that. Um, and just before I announce the winner, I um, just want to thank my fellow judges, um, the presenters particularly, for giving us a fascinating evening um, of uh, insight into um, what you guys do day in, day out. Um, and also just thank everybody for, for um, organising Science for All. It's a fantastic concept in its eighth year now. Um, and as Willie said, unfortunately, the national finals don't happen anymore, which is a great shame. Um, because this is, a, this is a fantastic opportunity to basically make science more accessible to all of us. So why did we pick uh, the winner? Um, <coughs> and it was a unanimous decision um, amongst all of us. Um, and effectively, I suppose what we felt was that this particular presentation was a complex enough concept, but we could actually have taken it having had the presentation this evening, and we would have been able to explain this concept to other audiences from here. We might not necessarily have gotten all of the science part of it right, but it was immediately understandable and it was immediately accessible for us. Um, so, without further ado, the winner for this evening is Bruno Godino. I guess I'll start by congratulating Bruno on his uh, presentation, on his victory tonight, uh, and to congratulate all the presenters. Uh, I'm uh, Alan Kelly, I'm the Dean of Graduate Studies in UCC, and I, I won't keep you very long, but I just want to, uh, and like to have the opportunity just to say a few very quick words uh, about, I guess, my perspective on, on what this evening is all about. Uh, I guess my, my focus and my uh, role as Dean is on the development of skills in PhD, study and over the last number of years there's been a huge increase in emphasis in, in UCC and in all Irish universities on developing skills other than the core research skills and realizing that students need to have a lot more in their toolkit uh, than, than the just being able to, to work in the lab and, and think of themselves as researchers solely. And one of the big focuses has really been on the whole area of, of communication skills as being one of the hugely important skills that we need to focus on researchers developing. And obviously, researchers, we know that scientists' communication is hugely important. Scientists need to be able to argue, to impress, to communicate, to convince, to explain. But we tend to think of them doing this at a very high level. And we tend to think of conferences and talking to peers and experts and theses and papers and, and the, the jargon and the heavy, uh, the, the heavy literature of the scientific world. But I think the, the most profound shift in recent years has been the realization scientists need to be able to do an awful lot more than that. And uh, I often think when we talk about this, at a quote, I think it's by Yeats, who said, think like a wise man, but speak the language of the people. And I think that's, that's kind of encapsulates a lot of, of what we're trying to do. We're trying to make uh, uh, researchers realize in every discipline that the ability to communicate other than at the heavy scholarly academic level is hugely important. To the lay audience, to the public, to those who justify and who fund our research, to the stakeholders who have an interest, and I, Pat, uh, Fitzpatrick in his opening remarks talked very eloquently about all the stakeholders uh, and, and the importance of the research that's going on in, in CES and in science areas in UCC. So it's, it's, 
uh, it's often overlooked this necessity for scientists uh, to be able to communicate to non-scientific audiences and to educate PhD students. But in UCC, uh, I think it's, it's a huge tribute that for eight years we've had this program, which I think has really been pioneering in the country. Uh, and I just obviously want to add uh, uh, my uh, thanks to, to Willie, uh, for, uh, who is, I guess, one of our the, the premier exponents of communication of science at a, uh, to non-specialists in the country, and to, to Catherine and to uh, Buckley and to Jill Haynes and to all the people who have been involved in organising this programme and to the a Elementary Pharmabiotic Centre and to Tyndall for funding it and that this uh, has been a huge success at UCC and beyond, and it's great to see Julie back here <laughs> again today uh, as one of our national winners, and as Willie said, we've had a great tradition. So I congratulate the participants. I think the standard of presentations, is, as the judges have, have said, is, was just fantastic. And I think it's great to, to be challenged, to have this opportunity to be challenged to present in this way. And it is, uh, as Anne-Marie just said, it's great to see that the tools that are used, the ability to use tools that we wouldn't see in a standard academic presentation often of humor, of analogy, of cartoons, of, of, uh, of, of video, of audiovisual standard. I think that the, the, the toolkit that's been displayed to explain these topics has been really impressive. And I think that, that everybody here uh, will feel, uh, as has been said, that they've really learned something new uh, tonight about something they didn't know before they came in here. And that's a, a huge tribute to students. And I draw particular attention. I always think that one of the hardest parts of a, uh, an event like this, and in fact one of the hardest parts of any scientific presentation, is you can get the slides right, you can spend lots of time over the slides, you can practice, you can, you can rehearse, you can get your timing right, you can get your words right, but the really hard part is always, the secret is, is it's the questions and how to deal with it, because you've no idea what you're going to be asked. And I think the challenge has been to, to you know, it's always challenging, in particular today, to, uh, to, to, to be able to maintain the level and the standard and answer the questions in exactly the right way. And I think that's, that's always a great challenge, and I, uh, I think that was really well done today. And I think, you know, just as a final remark, they say that, that you don't really, that the best way to understand something is to try and explain it to somebody who doesn't know what you're talking about. When you can't hide behind jargon, you can't hide behind the big words and the, the, the fancy uh, terminology, where you have to strip your ideas down to their bare bones and to really try and, uh, try and figure out how, that you can't explain something to somebody in simple terms unless you really, really understand what you're talking about. And I think that's one of the huge benefits of tonight and uh, of, is that I hope that all the students who participate in this program have got a new perspective on their research and have got a whole new way of looking at it and that the skills that they've gained, the experience they've had will last them long into the future and to the benefit of their careers. So again, thank you. Thanks again to our judges for their, giving their time uh, and, and uh, participating so actively tonight. And thanks to everybody for coming and congratulations once and all uh, to our winner, but to all of our participants. Thank you. <laughs>
it, it's a prize in itself because you are now published when you appear in the newspaper. Uh, your photograph will be with it and um, your mother will be very pleased. Uh, so it's a thrill to see yourself in a newspaper. <laughs> I speak with some authority there. <laughs> so um, that will be, and I'll be in contact with you, or we will be in contact with you about that. So you'll have to write the stuff up, your, your, your thoughts up, in um, a very easily understandable manner, um, as you had to do for tonight, but a thousand words. So that's that.